multitudes of our church members are not batting very well when they are thus tested. I believe that every organization of a church that doesn't function in services like this ought to be done away with. I cannot conceive of a Sunday school teacher who could sleep at night if all the students in the class were not here every night that didn't have both legs broken or working or something, or the WMU or the training union or the brotherhood or any of the 10,001 organizations we got now trying to pump up the old Ed cow. And I think we ought not to get discouraged, but we ought to rehaul the whole machinery. For if our machinery don't function, we better swap it off and get some that will. Amen? So we're being greatly tested. I am. I dearly love this godly pastor and his wife. I wish I could have been a help to them. I hope he'll get some sense. He's the hardest working man I've seen lately, doing what he ought not to do. Amen. What he ought not to do. Now, it's been a test of me. What shall I preach? And I won't note the judgment, what the Lord's purpose was here. But for better or worse, we've been speaking this week on the text in Second Corinthians chapter 13 and 5, and we've quoted afresh tonight, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. If he's rejected, you, of course, he's not in you. Last night, we spoke on my conviction, and I tried to enforce it by the word of God, that this generation has passed into a season of reprobation. Multitudes about us commit what we call the unpardonable sin every day, and their numbers increasing day by day. And the reason, of all reasons why we believe that is true, is that men are not seeking after the Lord today. Either those who profess to be Christian or those who don't profess to be Christian. The one thing that has break your heart if you follow the evangelists around was people who do not pant after God. I do not pay a great deal of attention to the acts good or bad of men, but I do think it's very, very, very important what their desires are, what they're, what they're looking for and what they're running at. The best man I ever saw could be picked to pieces in many different directions. But thank God, a Christian who's tasted of the Lord is bound to be a fellow that's running scared for more of Christ. I cannot understand the generation of so-called Christians who say I'm all right. I believe it's foreign to Christianity. And if I'm speaking a little truth that we do live in a day of people <clears throat> who seem to be pretty well satisfied with themselves, and their relation or lack of relation to the Lord. If that be true of people who at least tell you they're Christian, we need not wonder that those who make no such claim are full of excuses and alibis, but are not seeking the Lord. And that's a terrible state if it be true, and I think maybe it is, 
because the one unanswerable reason why this generation is not characterized by a hot and a holy and a persevering seeking after the Lord is that God has to create thirst and then supply it. And men and women are not thirsty for God now. And that's the most terrible thing we can face because the only one who can make men thirsty after holiness ain't making men thirsty after holiness now. It seems that God has left this generation of church members and otherwise to pursue everything else except him and go on to hell. Tonight I wish to speak on the subject, a thankful people in a reprobate day. A thankful people in a reprobate day. You'll not turn to it, please. I've fudged on you. I have it marked. I want to read one verse of Scripture in the Old Testament and then a passage in the New, in the 65th Psalm and the 4th verse. There is a ringing, blessed, hallelujah, praise the Lord, verse of Scripture. It reads like this, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. Oh, my! In the setting of the Old Testament, where God elected a small, insignificant nation and made them his chosen people, elected them out from among all of the nations. And then to read about how every time a false prophet came to town, they went whoring after him and departed the formal worship of Jehovah God, and how all of the calls to revival in the Old Testament days were nothing more or less than a calling of the people from going through the motions and giving lip service instead of heart worship to Almighty God. In, such a, in a setting like that, where the Apostle Paul will remind us that the whole outfit would have been as Sodom and Gomorrah, except that God remembers his covenant. Oh, to have lived in Old Testament days and to read this verse and say, Glory, 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 hallelujah. I have a lot of evidence and reason and hope to believe that this text includes me. Bless is the man whom God chooses and calls it to a pro unto him, that he might dwell in the courts of the land. It would have been blessed to be one of the people when the Lord was dealing with an elect nation, most of whom individually died or in hell tonight. For the whole gospel. But the scriptures say it was not mixed with what? Faith. Thus they died. It would have been blessed to have been one of the few who followed Caleb and Joshua and believed God instead of took counsel of their fears and their carcasses rotted in the wilderness and they're in hell tonight. What a blessing it would have been, what a cause for praise it would have been, but oh, how they would sing, hallelujah, that's the good, hallelujah, amen. They had some evidence in those awful days that they were one of those who, in spite of the way the elect nation went to hell, they were those whom God had caused to approach unto him. And there is a thanksgiving message like that in the second chapter of Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, 
In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, there is another man praising God, giving thanks, saying glory, hallelujah, amen. And in the message tonight, we'll see he's doing it in the awfulest context, in the most terrible, terrible context, perhaps in the entire Bible. And in this awful context, we'll read it in a little bit, where men have been given a strong delusion, such a strong delusion by the judgment of Almighty God that they can't believe the truth, they can only believe the lie. And they've been done that way because they did not receive the L-O-V-E love of the truth that they might receive. And God Almighty, because they didn't love the truth, brought them to the place they couldn't believe it if they'd have had it, and they could only believe a lie, and it did that in order that they might be dead. That's exactly what the Scripture will read in a moment. In that awful context, we we'll read verse 13. The Apostle Paul says in this context, But I've painted a dark picture, he said, of the time of Antichrist and the time leading up to it. But I am bound to give thanks. Verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always. We are bound. You couldn't keep us from it. Just bless God. It bubbles and it bubbles and it bubbles. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's all you got to do. Just give them a chance. Anybody? that is saved in the Old Testament time would praise the Lord. And anybody that's saved in this awful day we're living in now, brother, he'll be full of bubbling praise, thanking God that God saved. Thanking God. Thanking God. But we're bound to give thanks on all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. I won't be in that crowd with any hope for me. Folks that the Lord loves. And we're bound to give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Why? Because God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Well, unto He didn't just fix it so he hoped you'd stumble on it. Well, unto He called you. Thank God. Called you to what? Salvation calls you to what? The leaf of truth. Thank God he calls men. He calls. He chose. He appointed the means, the word, the spirit, and the truth of God. And then he didn't just run off and hope that we'd stumble on it, but bless God, he called you out of that awful atmosphere. By our gospel, called you to what? To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's something to thank God about. And anybody that's experienced it, brother, he'll never get over it. He'll never get over it. He'll never get over it. A thankful people in a reprobate age. I want tonight your indulgence as we go through the scripture briefly and get a description of the days that Paul is living in when he wrote these blessed words. I want us to get a new conception or have our old conception refreshed if we can on how wonderful it is to be snatched out of a day like Paul's day or a day like our day and called unto the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what fact I wish that it could burn in our souls again that it is sure enough something to be a child of God in this awful day. What a blessed, blessed privilege. Oh, praise the Lord for the sight that may be in any of us 
It is called us out of the black atmosphere of the day in which Paul wrote in the days just like it only was. We've been called under the opinion, bless God, of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does the New Testament teach that there was to be a falling away from the true faith of the gospel? Yes. Verse 3 here in this chapter says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the sin, the son of perdition. In First Timothy, at chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and teachings of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hard eye. They were all church members, remember now. Every one of these people that made a profession of faith. I'm going to give you a description of Paul's day, religious-wise, religiously-wise. Amen. All right. And then we turn to Second Timothy, and we read from the same man, the Apostle Paul, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men. What kind of men? Men with the names on church rolls, ladies and gentlemen. That's what he's talking about. Not the drunkard and the bootlegger, but professing Christians. Men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Reads like the description of the membership of a Southern Baptist church to me. It is, too. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Brother, you'd better if you don't want to go to the same hell they're going to. From such turn away. From such turn away. From such turn away. Read what the Apostle Peter said. This isn't just the testimony of Paul. The Apostle Peter will tell us in his epistle in the second chapter of the second book. We'll find it here in a minute in the second chapter, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. They'll bring them into our organized churches. That's what he's talking about. Amen. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Or let the Apostle John tell us in the second chapter of 1 John, little children, it is the last time. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come even now, are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time? They went out from us. Why? 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 Why is it typical? I'm a Southern Baptist, so I talk about my kinfolks. What's the explanation of the fact that the church has to have a thousand members now to have 500 in Sunday school, and 200 of them will be below the age of church membership? That's part of the course, brother. Remember that if you depart from a church that preaches the gospel, you've departed from Christ. Now listen to me. Remember that a church member who absents himself from the preaching of gospel is going to split hell wide open. He's quit Christ. He's apostatized. He never knew him to start with. He just thought he did. What happened to him? They went out from us, but they were not of us. They never were God's people. For if they had been of us, they would not have turned out 
our churches into places to go and flick out like we worship God on Sunday morning and then go to the beach and 10,000 other things the rest of the Lord's day. No, God's people don't do that way. But this is talking about a falling away, a falling away. Now, may I ask you this question and answer it the best I can? I don't know what your theology here is, and if I cross you, just forgive me. You apologize, and I'll forgive you. But here, here, when did this falling away take place? It took place while these epistles were being written. It's been going on now for nearly 2,000 years. This departure from the gospel is nearly 2,000 years old. And, brother, it's thinking worse every day. When did this falling away take place? Well, read again, 2 Timothy 3 and 1 and 5, this know in the last days, perilous times, from such turn away. Paul already said to Tim, you turn away from that out there. You go along with that crap. It's going on there. It's beginning there. Or read again the last verses that I read you. They went out from us and so forth. There are many antichrists going to come, and, and antichrist is coming. Now there are many antichrists whereby we know that is the last time. The falling away from the true faith of the gospel was even underway before these epistles were written. But, Brother Barnard, what about the New Testament teaching that this falling away was to take place in the last days? That's right. But the last days in the New Testament means the day between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We've been in the last days ever since Jesus went back to glory. We'll be in the last days till he comes back. Now, hold on. The scriptures speak of the times past. Hebrews chapter 1, God who in times past hath now in these what? Last days spoken to us in his, in his son. Now, the teaching of the word of God is that this all falling away from the true faith of the gospel even started in the days of the apostles. And it's been going on until this good hour. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And it's going to get worse until Antichrist appears. When I was a boy, I was given to God to be a preacher before I was born. I didn't know nothing about the last I see. But I was an infidel when I was saved, had been claimed to be one for four years. And uh, I was an infidel because I had to have some sort of peace, and I knew if I got saved, I'd have to mind God, and that meant I'd have to pray. This generation tell me they got saved, but they never have been obedient to the Lord. I don't understand no such fact as that. I tell you what's fact. I don't believe a man saved. If he's still bucking God, spitting ambear juice in God's face and telling him I ain't going to mind. And the issue between me and God was I knew if I ever surrendered to God, I'd have to do his will. If that ain't salvation, you tell me what it is. And I knew his will for me was to be a preacher. And I wasn't going to be one of these little old hitchhiking preachers like I've been for 39 years, not on your life. But when I was a kid, I, I, I didn't know nothing about it. I, I, I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have, he's going to have to be a preacher or go to hell. And you're going to have to do whatever God called you to do or go to hell too. I don't know what he called you. And I, I used to preach when I was a kid on the farm. And a chicken would die, a cat would die, a dog would die, something, we'd always have a big funeral. And if the chicken or cat or whatever it was, on, my daddy and mother owned it, I'd preach the funeral, brother. None of the other kids got to preach the funeral. And I was a stem winding preacher in them days. And I remember that our favorite cat died. And we had the biggest funeral that's ever held on old man Jim Barnard's farm, I'll tell you that. We put on all the rousements, and I preached the funeral sermon wouldn't quit. And we took that cat out and died. And I was so fond of the cat that when we buried it, I left the tail end of his tail sticking up. I wanted to go out and check on the cat every once in a while. And I did. And you wouldn't believe this, folks. But the, uh, the more of the days passed. Every day, go out and just 
pull that tail just a little bit, see if the cat was still there. And I know you won't believe it, but the smell was a little worse the longer the time went. Now, the cat wasn't a bit dead. Ten days after we put him in the ground, except the tail end of his tail, but he smelled a lot worse. And this one, in the big death of God, than it was when this falling away first to come, but it smells so much worse. It smells so much worse. This appearance of Antichrist ain't going to happen just like that without warning. I'm going to make an announcement. I know you'll appreciate it. It's warm weather. No, it ain't. It's cold. It's fall. At one o'clock today, summer skedaddled, and fall took jar. That's right. Well, it looks to me like it had been hot up till one second for one o'clock, and then it got cold, but it didn't. And Antichrist didn't hear it yet in person, but his spirit is here. Has the world been existing in a state of falling away from and apart from the true faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Nearly 2,000 years. No wonder this world's tearing itself to pieces tonight. It's been dead to God for a long time. And a dead carcass smells worse the longer it's dead. That's why this world is steeped in filth tonight. So far as the generality of professing Christian the world and it's the world over is concerned, it's been in a state of apostasy from the apostolic faith and has been since New Testament days. I started here with this terrible truth. The basic principles of the gospel are not believed by professing Christianity today. They have not been believed and taught all these years. There have been individuals who believe the gospel. There have been local congregations and groupings of congregations who believe the gospel. But for nearly 2,000 years, what we call Christianity has really been anti-Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, for nearly 2,000 years, organized Christianity has been preparing itself to welcome with open arms the Antichrist when he takes God. That's that God's truth. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are saved out of this awful anti-Christian spirit that's now erupting and threatening to wipe out churches off the face of the earth, you join the psalmist who says, Blessed is the man whom God chooses and causes to oppose you die in the course with bound to give thanks, beloved brethren of the Lord, because God has in the beginning chosen you unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of truth, and has called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I believe that if the Apostle Paul were to come back and preach today in our organized churches, the majority of every church we got would reject this message and refuse to hear it. Every visitation of God's Holy Spirit in the New Testament days. has been a blessed intervention of God to call people back to the true faith of the gospel. We thank God for every one of them. But it's been over a hundred years since we've had anything like that in the world. God is us alone without this thing people. 
Never. Even the Reformation. The poor church. And now, every church that was born in the Reformation has apostatized from the gospel. Every last one. There is no more similarity between what Baptists believe now and what they believed 50 years ago and between a bird and an egg. We have completely, as all of our Christians, turned out on the face of the gospel. I challenge you tonight that to be saved out of the old anti-Christian spirit even of Christianity today is a call for thanksgiving. That's the reason I know any about Christian in this world today will never get over praising God without of such a hellish atmosphere to pick them up and change them by grace put a new song in their heart. Now I want you to listen to Paul's description here of his days. You see how it compares with our days. In the second chapter of Second Thessalonians here, let me read it. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter it from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, that they shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, this is the religious setting, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what was holy, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now prevents will prevent until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after he's energized by, after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all, listen, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What God do about it? Nothing. Oh, no. Because men and women receive not the love of the truth. Do you wonder, Brother Barnes tells you, I know I'm right, that if you quit a church, that's truth of the gospel, and you still got to know. You quit Christ. You quit Christ. I just got to speak, I suppose, to in the inner circle of this church since I've been here. I've been doing my dead level best to say something to get you alarmed about the unsaved condition of your church now. They quit Christ. You can't tell me David preaches you don't believe, preach the gospel. I know he does. And if he does, all these church members with the names on the road. They are in danger of hell fire. That's right. You tell me you love so, well, quit frowning at me, so go after them, put your arm around them, warn them. They on that road to hell. How you know, Brother Barnes? 
They don't love the truth. The only way a fellow can get saved is he got to come the way he loves the truth. Amen. Because they receive not the love of the truth. Love of the truth. That they might be saved. They go to get it. And because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause, the next verse, God shall send them strong believers. And how strong shall it be? And this is something that's going on when Paul was preaching. And it's going on today. Only words. Shall send them such strong delusions that they'll believe the earth. The earth. And the reason they'll be turned over with such a strong delusion that they'll believe the lie is in order that they all may be damned. Who all shall be damned? who believed not the truth, and who had pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. A Christian's got no business being in a church that doesn't believe, lock, stock, and barrel, teach, preach, and live the truth of the gospel of Christ. Amen. And a fellow that wants to get saved, got, he better not mess around with a church that has departed from the gospel faith and where it's not taught and it's not preached. For I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, to do so is to bring God's strong delusion on men and women and fix them so they'll believe a lie and they'll believe a lie so that believing the lie they'll be damned and the ones that'll be damned are the folks who believe not the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. That was the situation in Paul's day. And for nearly 2,000 years, by and large, except for a few of God's people here, there, and everywhere, that's the God's truth. Little movements in every generation. Little handful here. Little handful of Brother David here. He's never had but a few. Thank God he's had them. Oh, how blessed to have been one of them. One of Christ's little flock. In such an atmosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, I face you tonight. I face you tonight with the wonder of being a child of God. In an atmosphere where men have been given up to such strong delusion to believe the lie. They believe the lie that they may be damned. As God Turn this generation over to such strong delusion that it believes lies instead of truth. That everybody shall be damned who do not do two things. First, love the truth. Brother, that strikes awful close to home. And who have pleasure in unrighteousness in such an atmosphere Glory, hallelujah. We are bound to give thanks. Couldn't keep us from giving thanks. If in the day we live in now, when everything under God's shining sun except truth is being proclaimed nearly and believed by the multitude, when the most foolish things out of hell get the biggest following now, in this generation where the truth is despised, witness the empty houses of the Lord on Sunday night. In this generation where people take pleasure in unrighteousness, witness the carnival spirit of this infidel generation. In that awful atmosphere, thank you, Lord. That you chose me and put in my path the work of the Spirit and the Word of Truth. Amen. Election is not salvation, it's unto salvation. God picks out of such atmospheres that He didn't do it, the old outfit would go to hell. But He picks out His trophies of His wonderful grace and monuments of His love. 
and blocks their road to hell with the striving, convicting, wooing, converting power of the Holy Spirit as he takes the truth. And he calls out men. My oh. And the Holy Spirit makes it real to men and women. He calls us to the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. That's God's people in this awful hour. Thank him, the Lord. Praise him, the Lord. That in a generation that's gone wild over everything except Called. You heard it. You knew it was God talking to you. Faith cometh by hearing. You said, That's God. That's God's truth. And in that picture, brother, that's God's truth. The man is calling me. generation. That's a thankful people in a reprobate day. Blessed is the man whom God chooses and calls him to approach his throne. Mr. Spurgeon said after he got saved, he went to preaching one day, and the preacher was wandering, saying nothing about like me, I guess, and he said he couldn't follow him, and so he just sat there, having lost track, and he just trying to trace, to trace his salvation. Paul said, thanks be unto God. For he is untraceable gift. And I tell you right now, it'll make the joy of ring in your soul. You start out to trace it. Oh, Brother Spurgeon said, you know, I sought the Lord. He did. As a young man, he sought him for years and years. He went to preaching place after preaching place. He's reared in a godly home and all of that. Had to go to a little old free Methodist chapel on a snow bitten day and hear a lame one just quote a verse of scripture. Laugh and live. And Mr. Spurgeon said, well, bless God, I look and I live. He said, oh, it's so wonderful not trying to trace it. He said, I found out I sought the Lord. I was earnest about it. And then I found out the reading I sought him was he first sought me. And he said, I felt love in my heart for the Lord. And I said, I love him. But I found out we love him because he first loved us. And he said, every direction I went in, I found out that the reason I was saved was God saved. He did it. Years ago, a big, rich contract in the state of Mississippi claimed to get converted under my little ministry. And after some years, he began to pour many thousands of dollars in my ministry, and we had a big five-fold tent and everything goes with it. We held association-wide, city-wide meetings for many years. And he footed the bill. And I got to be with him a lot. And one day we were riding down the highway going somewhere and we got in the fuss. We got in the fuss. He said, Ross, I love the Lord more than you do. I said, can't be. 
I know I love him more than you do. We really went after him. His wife used to phone all the hotels in Memphis and Nashville and Knoxville or St. Louis. Finally, she'd find him. He'd go and rent the whole floor of a hotel, fill every bathtub and all the rooms full of whiskey and invite everybody in the city that loved whiskey and part him to come. He put it to bill. He gets a drunk. He didn't know where he was. And she'd finally trace him down, go get him, bring him home, sober him up. That's the kind of life he lived. And one day he claimed God saved him. He said, fell as mean as I was. I know I love the Lord more than you do. I said, no, Fred. I never dr got drunk in my life. I never put on those parties. But reared in a Christian home, trained in the Sunday school, training union of Baptist churches, educated in a great Baptist college, President of the Infidels Club in that Baptist college my senior year. And in spite of that, God saved me. You can't tell me, honey. You can't tell me. Anybody God saves, he'll never get over it. He'll never get over it. Boy, I'll tell you the reason the Lord saved me, because I was such a fine fellow yesterday, every Friday night. In that great Baptist school, I'd speak to 300 young Baptist students that joined me in Fidel's club. And if you couldn't get a guest speaker, I'd speak and shake my fist and I'd curse God. And I'd dare him. They didn't like what I said to come down and do something about it. Boy, we had more fun cussing God and making fun of God than a barrel of monkeys. And God saved me. God saved me. I didn't accept Christ. God saved me. I didn't just make the profession. God saved me. I didn't join the church. God saved me. Blessed is the man that God calls it to him be the better for saving the sinner like me. Understand? While our heads are bowed, Brother Carter, will you just lead us? We don't need the music in the first verse. This will be our closing prayer. This will be the invitation. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, thank God. Even in this awful day in which we live, the God of all grace still calls sinners. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Why will you sing that first verse? That's the closing prayer. That's the invitation. You can sing it, you can pray it, right where you are.
every head bowed. Tomorrow night, God willing, we continue in the messages on this awful theme. I covet great crying to God on the part of God's people that the word may yet be honored and the Holy Spirit will discover men, split men's hearts open. Tomorrow night I speak on the folly of knocking at a door that God has shut to and will not open. And Saturday night, when God calls a sinner the last time, those of you who are Christians, wait upon the Lord and ask him to honor his word yet. I'll be honest with you. I don't like for the devil to whip us. I just don't. I, if I could lick him, I would. <laughs> but the Lord can lick him, and let's call on him. Amen. Good night. God bless.